My name is John Atkinson. I'm the editor of Stereophile magazine. And for the last 22 years, I've been accompanying reviews in Stereophile with a standardized set of measurements that I've developed. And so in the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to go through these measurements and explain how to interpret them, but also cover the areas that were not covered by measurements. So here are some descriptions of sound quality that are routinely used by audiophile. Accuracy, frequency balance, is, is there coloration? How, how extended is the bass? How extended are the highs? Is, is, does the sound have clarity and transparency? Can you hear into the sound stage? Is it grainy? Is it distorted? Is the sound stage wide and deep as it should be on any particular recording? Is the imaging precise, or does instead the, the image of a woman's voice wobble as she goes up and down the musical scale? Um, how are the dynamics? Does it play loud without distortion and compression? When it plays loud, do you no longer hear small details in the music that maybe a better loudspeaker would allow you still to hear? And does it have pace and rhythm, which is a really um, controversial subject? It, there are loudspeakers which make the music appear to go slower. Obviously, it doesn't go slower. It's just your perception is being affected. So. Those are the sort of various, all the areas we discuss as audiophiles. These are the measurements that I do. Voltage sensitivity, impedance, time domain behavior, the impulse plus depth responses, the phase response, the on-axis frequency response, the off-axis, it's dispersion, the radiation pattern, power response, nonlinear distortion, cumulative spectral, spectral decay, waterfall plots, knuckle wrap tests, vibration tests. The important thing is none of those individually correlates with any of those. That, that, sorry, that everything we hear, say for, exa say for example, I th you think this speaker has too much bass. It could be a, pr a problem with a frequency response. It could be a problem with distortion. It could be a problem in the time domain. Or it could be all three of those. And so the important thing to remember for measurements when you read them in, mag in a magazine like Stereophile is that out of the multidimensional character of the loudspeaker's performance, I am having to extract just two at a time, or maybe three, voltage versus frequency, uh, sound pressure versus frequency. Um, if I'm in the cumulative decay, decay spots, I'm, I'm looking at frequency, time, and level. But that at the most, I can plot three parameters in one measurement, and loudspeaker performance is multidimensional. So what I'm going to do now is just move on to all the individual areas, explain what they mean, and what, how I measure them. OK, the first thing I always publish in my reviews is the voltage sensitivity, how loud a loudspeaker will play for a given voltage. Lots of people confuse this with efficiency, which is a acoustic power out for amplifier power in. But no one measures power, acoustic power in the room. We measure a sound pressure level, which is equivalent to a voltage. So I always specify how, what's the SPL for a given voltage, which we standardize at 2.83 volts, which is equivalent to 1 watt into 8 ohms. Um, this is really often optimistically specified by manufacturers, because the speakers aren't flat. They'll say, well, there's a peak in the response at 2 kilohertz, and if we put in 2.83 volts at 2 kilohertz, we'll get 93 dB. So that's what we'll call the sensitivity. What I actually do is look at the sensitivity, sensitivity over the entire frequency band and come up with a single figure. Um, I use what's called B weighting, which is sort of rolls off the extremes so that you don't get over-calculated sensitivities due to a speaker, for example, having extended bass. And the mean is about 88 dB. That's pretty typical. Um, the median, that's the value which splits the speaker population into two, is 85. And this is pretty much typical for what you get. Speakers which have sensitivity over 90 dB are relatively rare, as you can see from the bar graph. Speakers which have less than 80 dB are almost non-existent. There are very few, and actually those tend to be large panel speakers, which um, have other things going for them, but they don't have very high sensitivity. I then measure the electrical impedance. 
This shows how hard the loudspeaker is to drive. As I said, 2.83 volts when I measure sensitivity is equivalent to one watt into eight ohms. But what a lot of manufacturers do will actually make their loudspeaker a four ohm speaker. So at 2.83 volts, the speaker is sucking two watts instead of one. So you get a 3 dB boost in apparent sensitivity. Um, it's also the first test I do because it's really diagnostic for a loudspeaker. It tells me what, the loud, what kind of loudspeaker it is and tells me if there are pro gives me the first indication if there's any problems. Um, here's a typical impedance plot. This is the amplitude. The left-hand axis is ohms. The frequency is plotted along the horizontal axis. Um, I immediately see, can I, yes, I immediately see from this peak, single peak in the base but it's a sealed enclosure. It's not a reflex design. Reflex designs have two peaks in the base, and the saddle between them defines the tuning frequency of the port. So this, but this is a sealed box. I immediately know that. Um, there's an interesting thing. There's a quite a severe wrinkle in the impedance at about 180 hertz. I immediately know that there's some kind of resonant problem with this speaker. Either it's a cabinet resonance, or if it's an acoustic resonance within the cabinet, but certainly I know that there's something going wrong there. Um, there's another little wrinkle here, about 27 kilohertz. This, this tells me, without even looking at the speaker, that it has a metal dome tweeter. That's the fundamental resonance of the, of the dome, of the tweeter. It's when the middle is out of phase with the um, outside of the dome. It's like, like if you one of those clickers where, you, where you, metal clickers used to have as child children. That sign, so that, I immediately know that's a metal dome tweeter. I look at also the phase angle. And the phase angle is mathematically related to the magnitude. Um, and it varies widely. And now, when you get a, an extreme phase angle like this, this means that the voltage and the current that the amplifier is being asked to deliver are out of phase. That you get the maximum current demand from the amplifier when the voltage, sorry, the maximum voltage when the um, the maximum current demand when the voltage is close to zero, which means the speaker is starting to act like a short circuit at that point. So even if it's an 8-ohm speaker, it's really taxing the amplifier. And um, when you look at what I, when I do in my reviews, is, is look for the point where you have the maximum phase and the minimum impedance, because that's really going to cause the amplifier problems. Fortunately, we are aided by the fact that the two are mathematically related, which is when the phase angle is at its maximum, the impedance is always going to be high. So we, we do have some help there. And again, you can see the wrinkles that are due to resonances appear in the phase response as well. Um, I, this, this was from a paper I gave to the AES some years ago. I just looked at you know, mean impedance magnitudes Mean is about 8.6 ohms, the median is 9.25. Speakers tend to cluster around between 5 and 10 ohms impedance. High impedance speakers are rare. Really low impedance speakers, which really give amplifiers a hard time, fortunately, are also rare. Then, OK, the next set of tests I do is looking at the time domain performance of a loudspeaker. The ear is not that sensitive to the time domain problems. It, it, anything which happens within a window of about seven milliseconds when it reaches your ear, the ear tends to treat as the same arrival. Um, anyway, the most more importantly, the impulse response carries all the information you need to characterize the performance of a loudspeaker. Here is a perfect in in impulse response. It's a very narrow rectangular pulse. It's, it's just a click. And this is what a typical loudspeaker does to it. It, it is messy. It doesn't look like the click. However, it would still sound like a click because all this activity occurs within the ear's integration time. Um, the sharp up-down spike is the tweeter, and then you have late, sort of slower follow-through from the other drive units. Here is a, a reflection. This is from the floor in my room. I've got the speaker on a tall pole, and this is the first reflection of the sound from a pole. So what I'll show later is that up to this point, you're actually looking at the loudspeaker's anechoic performance, as though there were no room at all. There's my first reflection. That's the first interaction of a speaker with the room. Okay, 
I, I almost never publish impulse responses because they're hard to interpret by themselves. So I always transform into the step response when in my reviews. This is the output of a loudspeaker reproducing a positive step. It's just first you have no voltage, and then you instantaneously rise to a fixed voltage where it stays. That's why it's called a step. This is what a loudspeaker does to that. It does rise, and, but then because to maintain that positive voltage or positive pressure, a loudspeaker would have to be able to reproduce DC, a DC pressure, which it can't do, then the output of the loudspeaker slowly falls back to the timeline, overshoots, and then there's a few reflections. So this is a really good step response. It looks very much like a right triangle. Instantaneous rise, slow, even decay. That's, that's a good time domain response, and there are almost no loudspeakers that good. Uh, the old Spiker TC50, which I think this was, did it. The Van der Steens do it. Uh, Quad Electrostatics do it. Martin Logan CLS. Uh, some of the Dunlavies did it, and now I'm running out of examples, because almost all loudspeakers instead look like that. They don't reproduce the step at all accurately. Um, However, what's interesting is from this, I can now die, I have an idea of the design of the speaker. This little spike here is the tweeter. The tweeter step goes up, decays back again. Then you have this step is in the opposite direction. It's the mid-range unit. And then that decays back to the time to timeline. And then this slow step with some undulations is the woofer. So I can immediately see this is a three-way design that the mid-range is connected out of phase with the tweeter and the woofer. Um, why would you do that? Well, the important thing in when you look at a step response, and I discuss this in my reviews, is that the decay of the tweeter step smoothly blends into the start of the mid-range step. The decay of the mid-range step smoothly blends with the rise of the woofer step. So I know immediately, without even measuring the frequency response, that the crossover on this speaker is well designed, that the outputs of the drive units in the frequency domain will give you a flat response, all things being equal. Just to show, show you, you know, there's the tweeter. Um, not good at aiming this thing. There's the tweeter, and it, there's some ringing after the event. Positive going. There's the mid-range unit. Negative going, then with some ringing in its output. And there's the woofer. A really good step. Slow rise because it's a woofer. It's fed through a crossover. Slow decay. Now, this speaker is interesting because this is one I reviewed quite uh, earlier this year. It's a Lin. And it has a super tweeter, which is the red trace. It has a tweeter, which is the blue trace. It has a mid-range unit, which is the green trace and a woofer, which is the black trace. And you can see immediately that the outputs of those drive units don't smoothly blend into each other. So the speaker is not time co co coherent. The outputs of the drive units are arriving differently at different times, but the decays of each drive unit are not, are not blending into that, the rise of the next lower in frequency. So I know that there's something not optimal with the crossover design on this loudspeaker. Again, before I even look at the frequency response. OK, on axis frequency response, this is what everybody regards as the most important measurement. There's only one way to do this with absolute accuracy, which is in an anechoic chamber. Uh, we on the magazine, unfortunately, don't have access to an anechoic chamber. This is a chamber which the, the walls absorb all the acoustic energy. So it's absolutely dead. They cost millions of dollars. More important, the real estate you have to build them on costs even more over time. So you have to find some magic bullet to be able to work out frequency response without having an anechoic chamber. Now remember I said the impulse response contains within it all the information to characterize the performance of a loudspeaker. Um, if you take the impulse response, you can use an algorithm called the fast discrete Fourier transform and turn it into the frequency response. Uh, this is what, how you do it. Um, is this working? Yes. So you've got a loudspeaker in a room. There's the floor. You've got the direct sound, which is the blue trace. And then you have the reflections from the room boundaries, which I've done as the red line. So 
if you then look at the lengths of those, trans those paths, you can see the red path is always longer than the blue path. So if I can actually just look at the blue path, the time it takes for the speak sound from the speaker to reach the microphone, and not any of the reflections, I'm in effect, as I said earlier, looking at the anechoic sound of the speaker. So this is, this is what I basically do when I'm measuring, when the weather's good. I put the speaker on a really high pole, and I have a very high mic stand. The speaker's about eight feet off the ground. And that's to push back the reflections so that they occur farther enough in time than I can get about a five millisecond time window that's anechoic. So, this is, so then I measure the impulse response. I then put my marker, I put a marker there. Um, that's where the first reflection occurs. So everything to the left of that marker is as though the speaker in an anechoic chamber. Then, so there it is. There's my anechoic impulse response. There's no room at all in that. Then the discrete Fourier transform stitches that impulse together over and over and over again in time, in effectively creating a continuous waveform of the impulse response. Then I try to transform it to the frequency domain where every frequency point in that graph corresponds to harmonic of the period of that synthesized waveform. So the, the width of the impulse response, let's call it, let what be five milliseconds, say. So that, that waveform then repeats every five milliseconds. And now I have a frequency response graph where the frequency points are spaced apart by the reciprocal of that five milliseconds, i.e. 200 hertz. So, so the first real data point is at 200. The next real data point is at 400. The next one is going to be at 600, 800, and so on. So the, the, you can immediately see the trade-off is that with my data points at, spaced at 200 hertz, I really have no real resolution in the mid-range. So FFTs are really good looking at higher frequencies, but because you have to window it you, and, get re, and you get reduced resolution in the mid-range. Okay. My lowest data point in that graph is 200 hertz. So what about the bass performance of a loudspeaker? It doesn't tell me anything about that. So to measure the bass, I use the near field. I put the microphone very close to the woofer or the port. And Don Keel, who used to do audio re reviews for Audio Magazine, showed in a classic paper in 1973 that when you do that, you're, remove, you're eliminating the room. The trade-off is, is you get this characteristic bump in the bass. That is not real. That's because you are putting the microphone next to the woofer, and you're getting what is an effect. The near, you're getting a, a proximity effect. So this loudspeaker would actually have a flat response if it were an anechoic chamber. But because I measured it in the near field, it has a little bump. And I always explain that in my measurements, that that's what you get when you add a near field measurement. You do a near field measurement. You can't help it. It's because the assumption is that the drive unit is in a plane that's infinite in extension in both directions. And you get this 6 dB bump, up to 6 dB bump in its response. Why, do I, why don't I correct it? Well, it's a difficult correction to make because it depends very much on the baffle size of the speaker. Plus, no one listens at an anechoic chamber. So the flat response would be an anechoic chamber. The slight bump you get from a near field measurement is what you would get when you're right up to the speaker. In real rooms, the speaker's bass response is going to be somewhere between the two. So I decide, well, I can't show one extreme. I will show the other. And by inspection, then you, it, you can get an idea of the speaker's bass response. That's a typical sealed box bass woofer. After the, it rolls off with a classic second order 12 dB per octave slope below its tuning frequency. There's a ref reflex. You have output from the port and the woofer. The woofer always has a notch in its output at the tuning frequency. There's the port. The port is, has its maximum output where the woofer has a notch. This is because at that frequency, the back pressure from the port resonance holds the cone still. The woofer isn't putting out any output at, at the tuning frequency at a port. All the output is coming from the port. Below that tuning frequency, the woofer and the port are out of phase. 
So their combined output, which is the middle line, rolls off at not 12 dB per octave, but 24 dB per octave. So with, with reflex speakers, and almost all speakers are reflex speakers, you get better bass extension in the mid bass, but then you, the price you pay is a steeper roll off. So you can get a situation where in a room, a sealed box speaker with a little less bass extension gives you more real bass in room because it's not rolling off as fast as a reflex design. Um, this is a pretty good speaker for amplitude response. You've got the rise in the bass due to the near field measurement. I splice the near field to the far field at 300 hertz. There's a little notch there, which is probably a, a cone surround problem, uh, but it's, in, it's very small. There's a little peak there, which may be um, coming from the first woofer cone breakup mode, but it's over trend, it's very flat. And then here's that tweeter resonance. It's ultrasonic, it's 27K, no one can hear it. And if you play CD, you will never actually excite that resonance. There's no energy on a CD above 22 kilohertz, so that resonance might as well not exist. However, if you play an LP, which does have good ultrasonic output, you may excite that resonance. And so you might find this speaker sounds better with CD than it does with LP, purely because the tweeter is not being driven into overload with CD. Here's a poor amplitude response. This is a speaker I reviewed many years ago. It was the Dana 2F. Uh, the company is out of existence, so I, I don't think it matters if I identify it. But um, this speaker was made a, a reference by another magazine at that time in the 90s. And so when we reviewed it, and I thought, my goodness, what is going on here? Because, you know, you, yeah, the bass, has, it's a, it's a, you know, rolls off relatively well. It's a little bit of a bump, so it means it's a little over damp. The bass is going to be tight and well-defined, not too weighty. The mid-range rises a little bit. Um, that's uh, due to the, the design and not equalizing the woofer to account for the width of the baffle. But then you have this horrendous notch in the low treble, which will make the speaker sound dull and recessed and uninvolving. Then it comes back again and there's some resonant peaks, and then the tweeter is covering this region here. And yeah, you can see it's got a metal dome, but, but its level is about 5 dB below the average level of the woofer below the crossover point. So what is going on here? And it basically is, the crossover is completely poorly designed. So the, dry tube, the woofer and the tweeter are out of phase here. They are working against each other, and the result is a cancellation of sound on the listening axis. The woofer, and I'll show you its waterfall plot later, is resonating like crazy. It's ringing like a bill at the very, like a bell at the top of its frequency band because it's being taken too high. So the designer, hearing that as brightness and hardness, has thought, oh, it must be the tweeter that's at fault. So he's let lower the level of the tweeter to address a problem that actually exists in the woofer. So this is a completely suboptimal design. And I don't understand how anyone else could actually like the speaker. Certainly when I heard it, I immediately heard these problems before I even measured it. This is the Lin speaker I showed you earlier. And Remember, the, the outputs of the drive units didn't blend smoothly in the time domain. So this is, again, the, the tweeter and the mid-range are out of phase in the crossover region, so you get a lack of energy there. It's going to sound uninvolving. This is the region where the ear is most sensitive. It's the presence region because it adds, if you have too much energy there, it makes it sound present and alive. Here it's going to sound rather dull. The woofer and the mid-range are also out of phase in their crossover region. So you're going to get a lack of body in, in the lower mids. But the tweeter and the, and the super tweeter blend relatively well on axis, however. So what does this speaker sound like? We gave it a good review. And when I, you know, I don't show my reviewers the measurements before they write the review, because I want to know what they think about a product without without you know, knowing what the measurements tell them they should be thinking. I want their honest response to whoops of the sound. So I measure it, and I'm, then I get the speakers set up in my room, because I'm interested. Why did our reviewer like this speaker when the measurements indicate it has some problems? Well, as I said, he, he commented on it, if I remember correctly, on it sounding quite detailed. And yet, I'm looking at this and thinking, well, that suggests it should sound a bit dull. 
And then, I've, then I th you think, think about it. Well, what is his ear acting at taking as a reference? Is it this, this point here at one kilohertz as being natural, and here is he hearing the, the lacks of energy above and below? Or is the, with the music he plays, is he taking these points here as his reference, and he's hearing this as added detail, this extra, what is then extra energy in the upper mids and the treble, and hearing this as impressive bass. And it turned out that was what he, what he was hearing. That's why interpreting responses which are anything other than flat becomes difficult because it's going to depend on the listener's music he plays. You can find a piece of music where this will sound dull and lacking body, but with the music our reviewer chose, he heard it as sounding, having magnificent bass and great detail. So you have to bear in mind that, that not, things are not always equal when it comes to interpreting measurements. What happens off axis? I mean, right now I've been looking at the direct sound from the speaker, the anechoic response, but we don't just, we don't listen to anechoic chambers, we listen in real rooms. And the speaker's off axis behavior contributes just as much to the sound you hear as its anechoic behavior. This is typical off axis behavior for a loudspeaker. I've represented the on axis response as just a straight line, so you can just see the differences. This is a very typical two way design. As, as you get up to the top of the woofer's passband, because the radi its radiation pattern narrows as the frequency increases, then you start, it, start, it starts to beam at the top of its passband. When you cross over to the tweeter, the tweeter at the bottom of its passband has very wide dispersion. Again, it's a function of frequency. And then, so here you have in room, this speaker has wide and even dispersion in the mid-range, Widen even dispersion in the treble, but in the crossover region, it beams intensely. So now you're going to have a sound which is lacking energy in the room, even though it's, it's flat on axis. So this speaker would sound lifeless unless the designer then adjusted the crossover so that on axis, it would have a little bit too much energy. So you're, you're listening to direct sound which has too much energy in the crossover region, and a, radiate, a sound field in a room which has too little energy in exactly the same region, and it's in a regularized sized room, they may well cancel out and you get a neutral balance. And that is what, loud, when, you, when you hear about loudspeakers voicing a loudspeaker, a designer voicing a loudspeaker, that's basically what they're doing. They're juggling the on-axis, the flatness of the on-axis response with the evenness of the dispersion off-axis to give a sound in a typical room which will sound neutral. If the room they're listening in is then very different, if it, what somebody buys that speaker has a much different room to the designer, they'll actually that balance will no longer work. And we found that in with an Acoustat a hybrid loudspeaker many years ago where it sounded wrong in all our reviewers' rooms. And then I went to visit the manufacturer in, in, in Arizona and they, they had voiced that speaker in a room this size. So the trade-offs they were making worked in a huge room which no one would ever own and were completely wrong for a small room as such as you and I own. Um, yeah, there's good off-axis behavior. Um, very even dispersion. The sound is maintained across a wide angle and it, there are no hot spots or gullies off-axis. This will always t tend to correlate with an even balance, a neutral sound if the on-axis response is flat, and good stereo imaging. Vertically, in, in multi-way designs, you get less even response because now you have the, the outputs of the drive units will add correctly on the correct axis, which tends always to be the tweeter axis, but then you move above or below that axis, then they'll start to be out of phase and you get dips in the crossover region, you get hot spots, so it's very important always to listen to your loudspeakers on the axis that the manufacturer recommends, because that's where he's optimized for crossover design. One of the measurements I've been doing since actually before I joined Stereophile is the spatially averaged in room response. As I said, you, when you're in a room, you're listening both to the direct sound and to the sound field in the room, which depends on the speaker's off-axis responses. 
Um, depending how far away you sit and on the acoustics of the room, both will contribute to the balance you hear. And so what is, is there a measurement that captures that balance? Well, this is what I do in my room. I, I, put, I measure the response in a grid, 36 inches wide, 80 inches deep. And I take 20 measurements within that grid, and then I average them. The idea is that any position-specific anomalies due to room resonances will tend to average out. And I'm left with this mix of the power response for spatial, the sound field in the room and the direct sound, which sort of reflects the balance I will hear in my listening position. And here are two speakers we reviewed recently. Uh, well, the red is one we reviewed recently. If I remember correctly, it's the teal SCS. No, it's the um, Audience 2 Plus 2, which Brian Damkroger reviewed. And the blue is an LS35A. My reference I've been using for a very long time, 35 years. I, I keep this speaker around. It's, I have a pair of Rogers LS35As from 1978. And I'm, whenever I measure speakers, I measure them too, just so I can make sure I'm being consistent year to year to year. So this is, the blue line is the Rogers LS35As. It's reduced bass, a little bump at its tuning frequency. Uh, but it's relatively flat through the treble. There's a little peak there, which is typical of the LS35A. It tends to sound a little bit too vivid in the upper mid-range. Um, the audience, very similar to the LS35A in the treble. However, it has this big peak in, in the, in the mid-range. And then you have a shelved down lower mid-range. And then being a reflex design, you have a little peak at the reflex tuning frequency. And then, because it's reflex, even though it's a much bigger speaker than the LS35A, it actually rolls off in room faster. So at 20 hertz, the LS35A is only 10 dB down from reference level. The audience is, um, gosh, where are we? 20 is 15, 25 dB down. So the bigger audience speaker, being a reflex design, actually has less real low bass from the tiny LS35A. But this, this red curve correlated very closely with what I felt the speaker sounded like. It sounded, had, sounded like it had just too much mid-range energy, too much detail, too vivid, too exciting. And our reviewer loved it for that. But I looked at it and felt this is actually a, an effect. It's not real. It's not neutral. So, there you have a conflict between my measurements findings, who is reacting very positively to that, and my measurements and my own listening, which are in the opposite direction. OK. Everything I've been discussing so far is linear distortion. Linear changes in frequency response, time domain. These are called linear distortion because they, it, it's very straightforward. However, nonlinear distortion where the loudspeaker is acting, extra, adding extra tones, extra sound, is something that I don't measure because I don't have an anechoic chamber. The only way to do it definitively is an anechoic chamber. The trade-offs you make with FFTs and quasi-anechoic responses are not really accurate enough to give you anything but a broad idea of distortion. And so I, unless, I hear, unless my reviewer has heard something anomalous or I hear something anomalous, I don't measure it. There's a general assumption. Small loudspeakers, small inexpensive loudspeakers will always dis 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 distort more than large expensive loudspeakers. That's just the law of physics and of money. The more money the designer can spend on the bill of materials for a speaker, the lower distortion it will have. So in general, that's what you're, a lot of what you're paying for with large loudspeakers is lower distortion. And that's just the way it is. It tends to limit the dynamic range, the nonlinear behavior. If a loudspeaker starts to distort, you will not turn it up to the point where it distorts. So but you, if it's a small speaker, you just won't expect as much loudness. The cumulative spectral decay plot I, I, plots I publish examine resonant behavior in the loudspeaker, where some tones in the loudspeaker's output don't decay as fast as they should. They hang, they hang on, they ring. And so there's a typical cumulative, cumulative spectral decay plot. What I, it, what I, the software I use creates it by taking a frequency response. Is this working? Yeah. Taking a frequency response, moving the time window 
forward a little bit in time, doing another one, and so on. So it's basically looking at the frequency response of a loudspeaker as you get farther and farther away from the original impulse. And you can see here that the tweeter rings like a bell. You've got this ridge of decay, decay, delayed energy at the frequency resonant. Fre tweeters don't break up frequency, which was about 27K. Fortunately, we can't hear that high. But as I said earlier, if you play an LP, you might excite that and drive the tweeter into nonlinear behavior lower down. If you play a CD, you won't excite it. Here you have a resonance in the upper mid-range, which is most likely due to a cone breakup mode in the woofer. And it might just add a little vividness, or if it's really bad, it'll add coloration. Here's that really bad speaker I showed earlier. So again, you have the um, suck out in the crossover region, but then you have this vicious, vicious breakup mode from a woofer cone. And then another one a little bit higher in frequency. And then the tweeter is relatively well behaved. But as I said, the designer was hearing this breakup mode in the woofer as brightness and hardness. And he was trying to solve that problem by reducing the level of the tweeter. But that wasn't the problem. The tweeter is fine. It's that woofer he was using, which is just, it just never should have been used that high in frequency. Um, I also use cumulative spectral decay tests to look at the behavior of a cabinet. Now, I have to, again, what I, I use an FFT in a cumulative spectral decay. This is an impulse response of a cabinet wall. I capture this by using an accelerometer taped to the cabinet. And I, I look at the back, the sides, the top, the baffle. And this, I'll play you, this is what it sounds like. I have to exit, exit the PowerPoint for a minute. OK, so this is the back panel of a loudspeaker we recently reviewed. And it sounds, this is its impulse response. You can hear it's just like somebody banging the cabinet with a stick. Can you all hear that? That is the cabinet ringing like a xylophone. And where are we? So if I go back to PowerPoint, play from current slide. OK, so there's the impulse response. And I, and I turn it into a cumulative spectral decay plot. And you can see there are the resonances of that, what you just heard. It's ringing like a xylophone bell, like a xylophone piece or a bell. And what's that going to do to the music? Well, I'll play you an example. This is a, actually, this is a, very, it's a different kind of resonance. This is actually in the port, but it has exactly the same subjective effect. This is a speaker we reviewed recently. That's the sound of its port resonance, very severe resonance. And this is what it does to the music. For this recording, I just put the microphone behind the port on the loudspeaker and played a piano recording, which, ten, which turned out to be very sensitive. And what you can hear is that port resonance, that is accompanying pretty much every note where the piano plays that coincides with it, a bit like somebody banging a xylophone while the music's playing. You hear it, bop, bop, bop. It's OK there. Then it excites for resonance again. You can hear every time the piano hits a note that coincides with the frequency of the resonance, you get this hoot. And again, my reviewer hadn't noticed it. So I said to him, did you play any piano recordings? And he said, no. I said, well, play some piano recordings. Tell me what you think. And thus demonstrating also that reviewers are mandated to use as wide a range of music as they can when they do reviews, because they have to find out where the problems are. Come on, computer. And he was like, oh, yes, now I hear it. Because it, if you just played, say, female voice, you might not notice that. If you just played orchestral, you might hear it as a little bit of added emphasis. But 
nothing too awful. But you play a piano recording where the notes are pretty spectrally pure in a sense, and there it is, that whistle, that hoot. So I talked about the loudspeaker measurements I make, um, the frequency response, the dispersion, the nonlinear behavior, the cabinet behavior, the time coherence, the sensitivity, the impedance. And what, as I said before, what's important is that not one of those measurements tells the whole story. What you hear always depends on more than one measurement. As I said, if you listen to a speaker which has too much bass, it may be the frequency response, it may be the time domain behavior of the port tuning, it may have just have too much distortion, which makes you think there's more bass there. Um, so, and performing them, any measurement, is, involves subjective choices. As I said, performance of a loudspeaker is a multi-dimensional thing. I have to choose at most two parameters or three to plot against each other to produce a measurement. And my choice of those, of those parameters will determine to some extent what the result of measurement will be. Measurements tell lies that, like with the frequency response of the Lin loudspeaker, the, the interpretation of that measurement is not straightforward. You could, like, you could hear that speaker as lacking in life, lacking in mid-range body, or you could hear it as magnificent bass and extra detail, more vividness, depending on, on the music you choose to listen to. Um, that that um, knuckle wrap test, that, that, that cabinet resonance, if you played music which never excited that resonance, you would never hear it. So the measurement is lying. It's telling me that, you know, that here's a measured problem that may not matter. However, as I said, when I played the piano recording, you heard it immediately. Um, measurements can tell you how a speaker sounds. The measurements cannot tell you if it's, any, if it's good or bad, except in a very broad way. When we do measurements, we are measuring the qualities of the sound waves in the air. When we report, when we decide if something is good or bad, whether we like it or not, we are reporting on the quality of internal models that we construct in our heads. And the correlation is poor. That you can get a loudspeaker which measures well, but leaves everybody feeling, yeah, it's just OK. And a very slight different measured change can result in a loudspeaker that is a winner that everybody likes. So the only reliable judge of quality in a speaker, of how good it is, is the listener's ear. And that ear has to be trained with listening to live music and the listener being true to what he hears. In other words, if you hear a loudspeaker that all these reviewers have raved over and you think it sounds bad, then you, you, for you, you are correct. You may be hearing something that all the reviewers decided wasn't important. It didn't fit in their worldview. And no matter how good the measurements are that we publish in a magazine review, if it sounds bad, if you don't enjoy your music, something is definitely wrong. So that's my presentation. I hope you found it interesting. I hope you read the magazine and read the, read the measurements I, I do. They're a major part of, my, of, of the work I have to do. Um, and we have some time for questions. Ah, now, now it appears. So, question, you, sir. Some uh, loudspeakers, after you listen to them for a while, become more fatiguing than others. When you're doing measurements, can you tell if a speaker is going to fatigue after a while? Not as such, but I think what you're listening to is that that speaker has resonant problems, and they may be low enough that in the short term you're not aware of them, but over the long term, there's that xylophone player playing along with your music. And that's what you're getting fatigued by. And if it's not actual just plain distortion, you're playing at a level high enough that the speaker is being driven into nonlinear behavior. Um, yeah, it's, so that's probably the, the result of that fatigue. Something is wrong. Your, your ear is telling you that that fatigue is telling you that something is wrong. How come some people can't hear bass distortion as well as others? Some people, it doesn't seem to bother them at all. It's like, it's like... Every, although everybody hears. Can you repeat the question, please? 
Yes, the question is, how come people and some people are not sensitive to base distortion? And the thing is, everybody hears relatively similarly, but the value judgments they put on what they hear are a matter of personal taste. For example, I really, I really dislike loose, flabby, uncontrolled bass. And I will sacrifice bass extension in a loudspeaker if I can keep it tight and controlled. Other people really want that, that chest-pushing low-frequency behavior, and they will put up with some distortion and with some you know, ringing in the time domain, the port which goes on ringing too long, in order to get that. And that's personal taste. So there's no right or wrong there. It's that some people like will put up with bass distortion because there's a trade-off that they like. Other people cannot stand it and will, will go for a loudspeaker, which is different in that respect. Sir? I have two questions, if you don't mind. Uh, the first question is some speakers do a very good job throwing out a Y and D vintage. Yeah. What measurements correspond to that? Uh, flat response. Um, very well controlled dispersion, very so that the reflections of the sound, particularly from the side walls, don't have a different spectral balance to the direct sound. Um, then you, a speaker which images well in that sense has very low resonances. There are, there are either no resonances or what resonances are are so well controlled they don't affect the sound because. Um, Let's say you have a speaker with the, that cabinet resonance I played. It's going to be slightly different in the two speakers. So when you're listening in stereo, that piano, actually, I was playing it in mono then, but if you listen in stereo, the image gets wider at the frequency where the resonances occur because it's slightly different in the two speakers. So if you listen to that piano, you'll hear the image narrow at some notes, wider at other notes. And that, that's what's happening. The speaker has resonant behavior is messing with the imaging. I mean, one of the things I, if you want to hear, you get a total diagnostic test of your speaker's ability to throw stable, accurate imaging, play dual mono pink noise, which I put on Stereophile's editor's Joyce CD. And what you should hear is just a narrow band of noise between the loudspeakers. If it smears at some frequencies, or if it sounds unstable, or if you don't get that narrow sense, then something is wrong. Either it's you're getting reflections from, say, a coffee table in front of the speakers, or from the sidewalls. The speakers are too close to the sidewalls. You could try putting some damping on the sidewalls if that's the case. Or the speakers may have an inherent problem which you just have to live with. So, how do you differentiate uh, a residence in the speaker like we're talking about versus a room? Problem. Rooms tend always to have problems below 300 hertz or so. 300. Yeah. So if you've got a very, you know, um, an article I published on our website about how to use the uh, editor's, my editor's choice CD to set up speakers is um, in the article I said, what you, if you, you get a friend over and you put him where the, we want to go to put the speakers and you sit in your listening chair and he talks. And you can hear the effect of the room on his voice. So you, you get him to move around until his voice sounds most natural to you. And that could be a starting point of where you want to put the speakers in terms of minimizing their interaction with the room resonances in the upper bass. Um, the other thing you do is with setting up speakers in rooms, never ever use the, you know, if you've got a speaker on a stand and it's three feet off the ground, you need the distance to the sidewall to be not three feet. You need the distance to the wall behind the speaker to be not three feet. You want it basically, the ideal would be the golden ratio, three, four and a half. Um, what's four and a half times 1.7? Well, I'll leave it to you. But you, that way, you, you're spreading the interaction between the speaker and the walls, the boundaries, maximally in time. You're basically spreading out the resonances in the room. Um, same is true of... of you know, any speed, and the rooms itself. Ideally, you want a room where the ratio of the width, the length, and the height are all golden ratio to each other. You get, and then you get an even spread of the resonances across the frequency band at low frequencies. So, it, you know, what you're trying to do is spread all the resonances out so none of them coincide. The worst example is to take a square, uh, take a cubical room which has, you know, 12 foot by 12 foot with a 12 foot ceiling, and then put the speakers, you know, 
three feet from the floor, which also three feet from the side wall, three foot from the back wall. Every resonance will happen at the same frequency, and the speaker will just sound, it'll just boom uncontrollably. So that's the worst case. You want that, so you just try and avoid it that. Uh, the best speakers I ever used in my room were the Revel Salon 2s. They were really produced the most neutral sound, the best combination of bass definition and best con bass control and the best imaging. I, I wept when I had to send them back. I, I couldn't afford to buy them, <laughs> but they were really good. Um, yeah, I mean, I, speakers tend to rotate in and out of my listening room, listening room a lot because I, you know... But, but I do miss those rebels. <laughs> so, when, when you're measuring for that average in-room response, mm. how, what signal are you using for that? Is what sign wave? I used to use pink noise and a spectrum analyzer. These days, I use what's called a chirp, which is uh, a very quick sweep in about two seconds. It goes from one hertz to thirty kilohertz, Whoop. and I use a software called Fuzz Measure, which takes that chirp, transforms it into the frequency domain. Um, it's very similar to the Melissa system I use for my regular measurements. I just do it, I do it that way because it's really quick. Using a spectrum analyzer and pink noise, and I'm doing 20 measurements for each speaker separately, it used to take a long time, whereas with the chirps, I, I get it done in 20 minutes. That was going to be part two of my question, is how long it takes to do that. But let me ask you, how long does it take you to do one of those complete sets of speaker measurements for, for an article? Um, when you look at a measurement sidebar in a Sterifar review, that is basically a day of my life. You know, I've measured 750 loudspeakers up to this point. So that's, what, more than two years of every day measuring loudspeakers. So that's, that's how to interpret it. It takes me a day. But I, I love measuring loudspeakers. What I hate measuring are integrated amplifiers with D2As and room correction and tone controls. Like the, we have a Harman Kardon amplifier review in our, our December issue, and it does all those things. And, and also has analog inputs, has digital inputs. You can digitize the analog inputs. You can apply correction. You have DSP. And it took me three days just to do the measurements. And so I told Cal Rubinson, don't do any of those anymore for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Question right at the back. Are your 750 measurements uh, archived? Yes. There's, there's a large number of them on the Sterifile website. And I'm adding, you know, every, every month I add the current reviews off, off, out of the print magazine, but also three or four or five classical reviews, like last week I, I, pub, I republished my Wilson Watt puppy review from 1991. And so gradually, there's, I think, there's, gosh, there must be, there must be 500 measurements, speaker measurements up there already on the Serifar website. It's sorted into stand-mounted bookshelf speakers and floor-standing speakers. Sir? Earlier in your slides, you didn't spend a lot of time on it. There was a, there was a, there was a big pulse graph that graduated to that step. Uh, okay. well, I, don't, I don't remember what you called it. Um, I've never really heard this talked about, but going back 50, 60 years, linguists and, and musicologists have identified the importance of, of onset transient identification. Yeah. Does that, cor does, does that measurement that you do correlate at all with the fidelity or, or the reproduction of the onset transient associated with the, the instruments? Or was it not? Let me just find the graph. It was very early on. Yeah. There's an easy answer, which I think is wrong. There it is. The top, the top one. Yeah, that one. There's a, a really good step response. That, as I said, speakers that perform that well are very rare. And that's a more typical step response. Do they sound different? Psychoacoustic theory would say no, they should sound the same. But the differences all occur between the, in the ear's integration period of less than seven milliseconds. So you can't tell the difference. In the click region. Yeah, they both would sound like a click. However, 
speakers which perform like that tend to have, I think, better stereo imaging and a more, not relaxed, that's the wrong word, a more accessible sound. Whereas a speaker like this, which psychoacoustic theory would say would sound the same, all things being equal, doesn't have quite that precision of stereo imaging. So it may be that, yes, the onset, the, the arrival of all the sounds of a speaker at the same time, what time coincident behavior matters, not when it comes to tone quality, but when it comes to allowing your brain to construct the stereo image. Because a stereo image is not real. It's something that happens in here. It's nothing outside. You, you, know, it's not, you can't measure it in the room. It happens in your brain. So maybe the, the time coincidence speaker allows your brain to more accurately and, and with more easily construct a stereo image. But that's conjecture on my part. I don't know of anyone who's done any research on that. You don't think it's related to, to onset necessarily. I mean, a C on a violin versus a C on a guitar, it, just in the Fourier sense, you'd say, oh, it's just this, this, this. But, but, but musicologists would argue that the onset is actually more important. Uh, is this related at all to that? Or yes, but I don't think, I don't, I think the onset of the sounds that the musicologists are talking about takes place over a rather longer time period. This is, you know, milliseconds. The, you know, the difference between most loudspeakers is all between the first arrival of the tweeter is at four milliseconds, and it's all over by eight milliseconds. That's four milliseconds. And so psychoacoustic theory says you can't tell any differences that's happening in that window. So, one of the issues is while well, uh, measuring dipole speakers. I hate measuring dipole speakers. <laughs> <laughs> it's because, well, first, if I can find the slide showing. There we go. OK. If you look at that diagram, the microphone is, I always use 50 inches. It's a convenient distance with the measurement setups I have to arrange that the difference between the direct sound, the blue path, and the reflections, the red path, is long enough for me to get at least some mid-range resolution. Also, a, a hidden assumption in measuring speakers is that the microphone must be at least several times the largest dimension of a speaker away, so you can be sure it's in the far field. In other words, you're getting the actual sound of a speaker. The closer you get to the speaker, the closer you get to the near field condition where you get this proximity effect, which tilts up below frequencies. So with a panel, a panel speaker that's five foot tall, I'm still in the near field at 50 inches for that speaker. So when I measure it, I'm going to get a frequency response which tilts up in the bass. Is that real? Well, if you put that speaker in an anechoic chamber, you won't get, you won't get that. If you put it in a room and you sit 50 inches away, you'll hear too much bass. So the measurement, the basic assumption behind the measurement is, is wrong. I'm not far enough away from the speaker to, to be out of the near field. But I can't get far enough away and maintain any resolution in my measurement. So with, if you look at the panel speakers I've measured, I, tend to, I do my stand 50 inches, and then I maybe go to 100 inches just to get to try and get far enough away. But they're very difficult to measure because they're big. And that's the most basic problem with panel speakers. The, the, um, the, they behave differently in the room. That gets shown by the um, in-room responses I measure. The time domain also is extremely puzzling with big panel speakers because you don't get a clean impulse response. You get a very hashy looking impulse response. And the cumulative spectral decay plot is very hashy. If you look at my MagnaPan speaker reviews, the cumulative spectral plate decay pots are, are terrible. And now I said, remember I said measurements tell lies. And I suspect that with a large panel speaker, the measurement's lying. And the reason, here's my reasoning. A panel is driven across its entire area. The average response of every aspect of that panel follows the driving voltage it moves in or out. However, the individual elements of that panel are wiggling. They're, they're shimmering, as it were. 
they're actually behaving mathematically chaotically. Their average position moves with the driving voltage, but the, every element of that panel is shimmering. This is, and years ago, I was at a lecture by the mathematician Manfred Schroeder, who said a key indicator to chaotic behavior in a system is the production of subharmonics. So I found that with panel speakers, if I put in a one kilohertz tone, you get subharmonics. You get a tone at 500 hertz, as well as 2 kilohertz, 3 kilohertz, 4 kilohertz for normal harmonic distortion. So I think with a panel speaker, the measurement is lying to me because of that chaotic behavior of individual elements of the panel. Uh, if you're not measuring a panel speaker, but if one using dynamic drivers, then what's the issue on dynamic speakers? Well, when it's a big speaker, you still need to be in the far field. And if you have a six foot tall speaker with a tweeter at the top and woofer at the bottom, at my standard measuring distance of 50 inches, I'm not, still, I'm not in the far field still. So there is that effect going on. Fortunately, those kind of speakers are really rare. Right, right at the back. In a typical speaker like the one that you showed in your drawing, yeah. uh, listening or just testing, if you tilt it back, do you get any benefit? Yes. I mean, I'm measuring it on the super tweeter axis, which the designer Told, told me is the, the correct axis. However, if I find that, um, that time domain response of it, if you tilt it back, then you're in effect moving the tweeter further back in time, and it may then, be, may then coincide with the mid-range output. So you either tilt the back or stand up, and you will actually get a better integration between the drive units. But then you're also moving the mid-range back with response to the woofer, and you may mess up the integration there. It's, yeah, you can, you can try sitting at a different height with a speaker like this, or tilting it back to try and get a sound which is more neutral. But it's problematic. It's with, a with a speaker which, where the drive units don't integrate on the correct axis, you're, you end up chasing your tail trying to optimize it. And I don't understand why they would design it like that. Sir? We all would love to cry to the rebel speakers you were uh, mentioning. Uh, Do you know if they're in this building? Yes. Well, they're in eighth floor, the Harmon room, and they're alternating between the Revels and the JBL Array 1400, which is also a really good speaker. Thank you. What's the time? Well, we have time for about one more question. Ma'am. On your knock uh, test. Yeah. Am I to infer that when you knock on the cabinet, then you don't want it to, to be resonant? Yes. When, I mean, right, let me play it, play that one again. It's, it's a, just because I like doing it. Where is it? It's, it's, you don't want that at all. That's a, that's a note on a xylophone. What you want is to be able to go and not hear anything at all. Um, on the, again, I, I, don't, I, mean, I, I, I don't want to be accused of promoting a stereophile CD, but on my editor's choice CD, I put very interesting test track. It's half-step spaced tone bursts. It goes boom, 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 boom. And if you listen to your speaker cabinet with a stethoscope, it'd be ideal. As it goes boom, 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 you hear the cabinet singing at some frequencies and not others. If you don't hear it singing at all, that's a great speaker, well-behaved cabinet. With some speakers, you play that track and it excites, even though it's not very high in level, it excites them so much that if you pause the CD player, you hear it go bong, and that's not a good speaker. Or you can, what can you do to fix that? Well, you could try putting something like a bag full of sand on top of it, change the resonant behavior of the loudspeaker, try and get the range that you might change the resonant frequencies just enough that they'll no longer be excited with music. The, we all listen to music that's tuned in the Western scale, and there are gaps in the spectrum. And if you can make a resonance fall between the notes, as it were, it won't be excited, and you won't hear it until you play a drum, which has a wide spectral bandwidth, and now it'll play along with the drum. But at least that's not as bad as playing along with the piano. 
Well, thank you everyone for coming. I, ho I hope you enjoy Stereophile, and more importantly, I hope you enjoy this show. It's a great show. Thank you.